In the long history of the Catholic Church, her bishops have met 21 times at ecumenical councils, each time for the stated purpose, either of condemning heresy or defining dogma, or both. When John the 23rd convoked the 22nd such meeting, however, he made it clear that this council, the Second Vatican Council, was not to define dogma in order to condemn heresy. In fact, his synopsis of the state of the church at that time was rather rosy. All he wanted to do was, uh, at this pastoral council, was to help pastors usher in the new springtime in the church. By almost every measure, it would be a springtime that never came. And that's the title of a new book published by Sophia Institute Press and its illustrious author, Bishop Athanasius Schneider, who joins RTF for the first time live to discuss that book. Your Excellency, welcome to the program. Thank you. Um, I want to be absolutely respectful of your time, uh, and your time is brief, so we'll get right into it. Firstly, thank you for writing the book, or rather for um, answering the many questions of your Brazilian interviewer. Uh, the first topic that jumped off the page for me was COVID. I want to pull up three separate quotes uh, of yours from the book because I think that everyone needs to hear them. Here's the first one. You say on page 14, many church leaders have been involved mostly with secular, worldly, and temporal matters, and as a result, they have become blind to supernatural and eternal reality. Their eyes have been filled with the dust of earthly matters, as St. Gregory the Great once said. The reaction to the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed that they care more about the mortal body than they do about the immortal soul. Your Excellency, that's, I think that's pretty true, and a lot of us who felt betrayed during the lockdowns uh, agree with that assessment. Yes, uh, we, could, we could state this all, all over the world. Uh, of course, not every bishop behaved in this way to prefer the corporal health rather than the spiritual, the, the health of the soul. But we could, uh, this was uh, an evident phenomenon, which we could state. And I think it was in some way a logic consequence of the last um, past decades where the life within the church was more centered on temporal issues. Uh, and po and political or temporal, uh, and so it was a turning uh, since the council more to the temporal and uh, affairs, and forgetting the primacy of the eternity of the eternal life, and so it was this COVID situation. Uh, a demonstration of this uh, exaggerated, one-sided yes. attitude of so many churchmen to prefer the temporal rather than the eternal. And this is one of the deepest roots of the crisis within the church. You say on page 23, the COVID-19 pandemic, to the best of my knowledge, has created an unprecedented situation in the church, the worldwide ban on all public celebrations of Holy Mass. Uh, you say that the ban on public worship was issued by Catholic bishops, and in some cases, it happened even before relevant government regulations were published. Your Excellency, I certainly witnessed that to be true in the United States of America, where many bishops preemptively locked down in anticipation that their state or their uh, municipality might later on lock them down and they're already in compliance. I've already noted um, last year or two years ago that the Catholic Church in the United States took three and a half billion dollars in bailout money from the federal government here. I don't know how it was around the world and in Kazakhstan where you were. But I have to wonder out loud if maybe, you know, locking down in exchange for the bailout money from the government was a pretty raw deal for Catholics. Yes, this is very sad. Uh, as, uh, as I repeat, this pre uh, preference, uh, primacy of the temporal issues and um, 
uh, I think that uh, it should be again uh, to all uh, in the church uh, a sign uh, to return to the primacy of Christ, to the primacy of the eternity, of the, li of the life in grace, as the, the prophets uh, reminded along the history in the Old Testament and so many saints uh, with their prophetical voice and reminding the people that you have abandoned uh, the fountains of true water, the true water which God gives you, the fountain of the sources of true life, mm -hmm. and have turned to what is not giving you life, uh, true life. So, not only the short passing corporal life. And so I think that we should and these churchmen listen to the voices, the ever um, the timely voices of the prophets, to read again the prophets. It is very timely for our day. And the great saints uh, in the church that um, who preached uh, penance, repentance, conversion, this we need. Yes. Uh, not to beat a dead horse, but final quote of yours just on this topic. Page 24, you say, the situation in which the public celebration of Holy Mass, and I thought this was a really interesting point. Uh, it's so grave. We have to look for a deeper meaning in it. These events are happening almost exactly 50 years after the Holy Communion and the hand was introduced in 69, and after a radical reform of the rite of Holy Mass was implemented in 1970. Now, that's the jubilee year of the Novus Ordo Mise, Your Excellency. The jubilee year should be a a, a year of uh, celebration. It should be a year of uh, you know for for any other jubilee you, you you would celebrate it. But on this jubilee year, I think almost to the day on March twenty third, twenty twenty was almost to the day fifty years after the promulgation of the Novus Ordo Mise. and Almighty God, perhaps in His mercy. Uh, canceled the Novus Ordo Mass. And in the only Masses that, to my knowledge, that were happening underground were, were traditional Latin Masses. Uh, yes, the, this is... Uh, have to, we have to reflect about these facts. And uh, I don't know if there were clandestine Masses also in the Novus Ordo. Maybe there were. We have not the exact uh, overview of the situation, but what we can say that the at least the overwhelming majority of those holy masses which were celebrated nevertheless in a kind of you know, secret or clandestine manner were uh, the masses in the traditional form. Uh, and this we have to simply to state uh, this was a fact. And because this is also a demonstration that the traditional liturgy is more evidently and, and um, expressly, expressively marked with the elements of supernaturality, supernatural uh, or reverence the vision more of eternity. Uh, I don't deny this for the Novus Ordo, not. But I, I say more clearly stressed in the traditional form of the Holy Mass. And so it was uh, only a, fact, a matter of fact that the, the, uh, the majority of the Holy Masses which were celebrated in never in spite of some prohibitions where these forms, the, the traditional form of the Holy Mass, because the priests and the faithful who were attached to this form were more penetrated. Thanks to this form of the Holy Mass, as I repeat, 
with the conscience and the longing for the eternal values. Uh, and so, uh, I think uh, uh, we have to, to restore ever more these, uh, also in the Novus Ordo, uh, these aspects of stressing more eternity, uh, sacredness, uh, which all this is, which will give us strength and consolation, even in such difficult times as it was the COVID situation, uh, these prohibitions, or maybe in times of real persecution of the church, mm -hmm. this will give us true divine consolation, mm -hmm. the Holy Mass in such a reverent form celebrated. Yes, agreed. Your Excellency, I'd like to move to a new topic, and that topic is uh, more or less the overall topic is papal infallibility. But you, ad you address this issue in particular in your book when you talk about capital punishment or the death penalty. I'll pull up um, a quote from page uh, 158 in which you say, this is a revolution and a rupture, uh, and this is referring to the uh, Pope Francis changing the catechism on um, capital punishment. Introducing such a change exceeds the limits of papal authority. The First Vatican Council, which defined the doctrine of papal infallibility, declared that the Holy Spirit has not been given to the Pope to introduce new teachings or to institute them, but to faithfully guard the deposit of divine revelation, a change in the stance of, uh, on the permissibility of the death penalty is an abuse of papal authority. That phrase, Your Excellency, an abuse of papal authority, I think is something that we don't hear much of. But it is uh, a fact of reality of our experience. So we cannot deny the facts which we are seeing and observing. We have to see this in the vision of 2,000 years, not only of one pontificate, and this is Catholic. And as the great popes in the times of the fathers of the church taught and behaved themselves uh, uh, regarding to the doctrine of faith, um, and in this case, I think that such drastic changes in doctrine or in liturgy was never in the history of the church. Simply, this is a fact. No one can find a pope who made drastic changes or who denied what all their predecessors taught along a really uh, in memorable time, yeah. space of time, or the same liturgy. There was no Pope in the Church until Paul VI who did such, to that extent, a drastic revolutionary change in the Holy Liturgy in such a short time, or even a drastic change. There, was, there were changes, of course, some liturgical reforms, but very careful, really very small changes, but not uh, in a drastic manner such. Uh, even the, the Pope Pius V, uh, after the Council of Trent, he did not touch uh, substantially the order of the Mass. It was the same. So there is a missal, printed missal, from 470, exactly 100 years before the Missal of Pius V. And it's exactly the same order of Mass. So the people did not, uh, were not aware of a change mm. if, after the Council of Trent. Uh, the, changed, the changes were made only in the Missal, in some prefaces, sequences, or the the feasts of the saints, uh, but not the the order of the mass itself or the sacraments. The, the one manner to 
celebrate baptism or, or the priestly ordinations, there are no changes uh, substantially even when they were only uh, really small, very, very um, small changes. And so this is an example for an abuse of papal authority to make, as Paul VI did, such drastic changes in the Holy Liturgy, in the Mass, which is the most uh, solemn and central expression of our faith. And so Pope Francis, declaring that this penalty is <clears throat> in itself uh, not permissible, in itself. So this contradicts all the catechisms which the Catholic Church had since uh, centuries. So a Pope cannot contradict what, what centuries along the Church taught. Even John Paul II, he was personally against death, penal, uh, death penalty, but John Paul II stated that uh, in, in say, so it is uh, permissible, this principle of death penalty, but in our uh, circumstances, it should not be applied because we have other means to protect the society. So this is a difference, the attitude of John Paul II to this topic, uh, to that of Pope Francis, because this was Pope Francis stated, and he is, it, it is a drastic change in doctrine, and this cannot be. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of Paul VI, Your Excellency, I actually have two separate questions about him uh, since he's come up. The first is, is that um, you, you reference his revolutionary changes to the liturgy multiple times in the book. And uh, a lot of traditionalists are presented with a fairy tale. And the fairy tale is that there was this bad guy named Bugnini. And Bugnini did all of these things right underneath Paul VI's nose. Paul VI is a saint. And everything he did, everything he touched turned to gold. But it was Bugnini who was really the evil one. And he was a Freemason. And he did all of these changes and and uh, sort of convinced Paul VI that these were that this was good. In fact, this actually came out in 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 a recent documentary about the Latin Mass. This was the story that they were pushing. Whereas in your book, as I read it, I mean, you know, you 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 sort of lay the uh, the responsibility, I think rightly so, at the feet of uh, the Holy Father. Uh, how how can we square these two competing stories? Um, how can they both be true? Um, yes, uh, it was evident that uh, Monsignor Bugnini, he was since the Pius XII, uh, very much influential in the liturgical reforms, but mostly under Paul VI. And we have documents uh, which state his incompetency and his drastic forms of behavior and thinking there are two historical studies, the diary of cardinal, of a cardinal who participated in these um, <clears throat> uh, committees or for the reform of the liturgy, Cardinal Antonelli, a Franciscan cardinal in those times, and they were published, his diaries and his commentaries, how Monsignor Bugnini proceeded and very questionable methods. Uh, and then the other, the memoirs of um, Father Louis Bouillet, a French priest, and who was also a member of the committee. And, and so uh, we have these documents. The other documents are not accessible to historians now if Monsignor Bugnini was a member of Freemasonry. There, there are some rumors. But what he did already is, uh, and his words he, which he spoke, it's very problematic. And, and, and seeing that he had not this fidelity and uh, he was not careful 
regarding the tradition of the church and the Catholic faith, but rather in a kind of super, uh, superficial attitude. So, from this we can, uh, from these books, historical books, and his own statements, we can see uh, his uh, aims were um, to adapt the Catholic Mass to the more to the to the Protestants to come closer to them and to the spirit of this world, of the yes. modern modern culture. So. Even if he was, if even, let us say, if he would not be a Freemason, this already would be very problematic, such uh, statements which he made. And his behavior in the commission, which were documented by these two books, uh, which I mentioned. And, of course, the last pos responsibility has not... Uh, Father Bugnini, but Paul VI, because he approved this, and and he himself celebrated this Novus Ordo, which yes. he could he which he could see the drastic changes himself when he started to celebrate, and uh, he see he uh, at least the Ordo Misse he himself uh, before he approved. The changes he had to read this at least not the entire missile maybe he did not read the entire missile but the order missile surely he he was reading this and there he could notice these drastic changes and the pope cannot approve such drastic changes mm. uh, to in the liturgy this is impossible that never the popes did this and yes. this is an abuse of power that the, the Pope has to carefully keep the tradition. He can make reforms, of course, but in a very careful manner, as did the same Pope, Paul VI, in the first reform of the Order of the Mass, which was the, the Second Vatican Council Mass reform in 65, in the beginning of 65. Paul VI himself made uh, a reform or approved, which was very um, organic, careful. The so-called 65 mass. This is usually not known, but this is mm, a very careful uh, form of reform the mass. So this he should have been keeping the 65 mass which also Monsignor Lefebvre accepted and celebrated, Monsignor Lefebvre, mm. celebrated uh, 10 years from 65 to 75. Monsignor Lefebvre celebrated the 65 form of the Holy Mass, the, with the reforms of Paul VI already, which was, I repeat, very careful and few only. So substantially it was the old Mass kept. Uh, only we had dropped the Psalm 42, but this was also the case in the Masses of Requiem before the Council or in the last two weeks before Easter, the Passion Tide. Also, the Psalm 42 was not prayed uh, in the beginning of the Mass. So it was not such a revolutionary change, let us say. And yeah. then, and the last Gospel was also dropped, but in some occasions also before the Council, uh, the last Gospel was not prayed. There were rare occasions, but in any form it was not so drastic. And the rest was kept, only that uh, the local, the vernacular language was allowed in the first part of the Mass. But not, this, is, this was a question of the language, but from the preface and then the canon of the Mass was compulsory in Latin. Even in 65, Paul VI mandated to keep Latin in the preface and in the canon of the Mass. And the canon of the Mass was silent also in 65. This was the reform of Paul VI in 65. And he should, I repeat, had, have kept this. And, but he yielded 
And in this way, he collaborated with this project of a revolutionary change of the Holy Mass, which was more closer coming to the Protestant form or shape on understanding of Mass. I'm sure Your Excellency is aware that the Benedictines uh, in Clear Creek in Oklahoma in the United States do celebrate the 65 Missal. Your Excellency, I have um, one other question about Paul VI, and then you brought up Monsignor Lefebvre, and I have some questions about that as well. My second question about uh, Paul VI is the following. On page 272, you say, I think we also have a right to discuss the canonizations that have already taken place and whether, in fact, we were given the right model. We can have legitimate doubts about them, and we have the right to express these doubts. In my opinion, Paul VI shouldn't, shouldn't have been elevated, should not have been elevated to the altars and declared a saint. For in this way, he was shown to be a role model, and therefore his revolutionary reform of the rite of the Holy Mass would also enjoy an endorsement. Your Excellency, it looks like we're on track to canonize every single Vatican II Pope. Is that also a continuation of the endorsement of this Second Vatican Council? Yes, this is evident. Uh, it is too evident that these canonizations are a kind of canonization more of the council rather than of the popes. And they were done in a uh, very, it was very quick done. So it should be had more time to investigate, to, to, to wait the, the history simply, because a Pope uh, is a person involved in so many aspects. And even uh, Pope uh, Pius X, who was really an evident saint, really, he was irradiating holiness even even in those times, not non-Catholics, uh, diplomats who were in the Vatican, they testified his holiness, really. It was evident he a man of God. And so, and even in the case of Pius X, he was canonized more or less 40 years after his death, 40. So it should be more time, I think, in the case of uh, these conciliar popes and also the problematic after the council, the crisis of the church connected. Of course, not always we can say that every uh, problematic aspects after the council were, were uh, the reason in the council but it was oftentimes also an abuse of the council by these liberal churchmen. They took the name of the council to simply, uh, under the pretext of the council, to introduce completely uh, changes which were not Catholic. So this we have also to take into account this abuse of the name of the Vatican Council, but nevertheless, yeah. There are also problematic aspects in some uh, expressions in the council, and they, this too optimistic view of the of the modern culture, which is not optimistic. Even sixty years ago, it was uh, substantially anti-Christian, materialistic, uh, and so this is also an, a, a very important aspect: the historical circumstances to wait. Mm. And simply the facts uh, of these revolutionary changes in the Holy Liturgy and also in the aspect of the doctrine, of the approval of the document on religious mm -hmm. liberty, which Paul VI did, it's also at least highly ambiguous mm -hmm. in yeah. doctrine. And yeah. such a, a Pope has to be an example in clarity, in doctrine also. And this is, this is, to my opinion, a serious reason which speaks against the canonization of Paul VI, these aspects. Yeah. Um, and so uh, we see 
that this is a very, uh, in kind of way, uh, ideological canonizations. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Well, listen, for those who are, are in the chat and watching who are wondering if you actually do believe that Paul VI is in heaven, you do write in your book that uh, Almighty God respects the authority of the church so much that if the church declares that he is in heaven, he is in heaven, but it could be in spite of his life, not because of his life. Of course, uh, there are so many people in heaven, we believe. Even, I think, many of our relatives our, uh, are already uh, left already the purgatory and are in heaven. But I will not canonize, let us say, uh, my pious grandmother, or uh, even so she left pious and, and I believe she is now in heaven because she passed probably already her purgatory. I will not promote her canonization because this has to be a, a canonized is a model, an example in every aspect. So this is to give an example. It's not a question if, if Paul VI is in heaven. I believe he is in heaven and he he maybe he already passed his purgatory and when the church is doing the canonization i can believe that in the power of the keys which christ gave to peter the keys yeah. uh, that god respects the act of canonization and maybe in that moment uh, frees the soul from purgatory and let the soul enter in the heavenly in the beatific vision and he can intercede for us because everyone who is in heaven can intercede for us and the church gives us the guarantee yes you can pray to Paul VI to intercede for you but this is not the question here the question is the, the, uh, the eximious example and model of this Christian who, who may be now probably be in heaven, of course, uh, th his example for the entire church to present him as an example in every respect. This is the another question which we have to uh, observe and take into account in the issue of the canonizations as well. Yes, sir. You mentioned another cleric, and in fact, you, you said that he lived a saintly life uh, you mentioned Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. I want to read uh, a couple, uh, well, four different quotes from uh, three different pages in your book. And it says, Archbishop Lefebvre was a great man. He passed on the faith, the liturgy, and formed new priests. Under no circumstances should he be accused of being schismatic. It would be appropriate for the Society of St. Pius X to be officially recognized by the Holy See and to be fully integrated into the life of the church with all canonical rites. I think this will one day happen. Lefebvre was a man who lived a saintly life and had no schismatic intentions. This is high praise. Your Excellency, it's really difficult to talk about the traditional movement without mentioning Archbishop Lefebvre, and yet so many churchmen are able to somehow do that you uh, boldly talk about Archbishop Lefebvre directly. You said he lives a saintly life and that he's not a schismatic. Um, you, you broke down uh, in the book other reasons for why you think that, uh, including you know the early church and how um, consecrations worked uh, back then, et cetera, et cetera. And I encourage people to buy the book if they want to hear your full argument. Um, but my question is, is, I want to zero in on the very specific statement you make where you say, that the Society of St. Pius X should be regularized within the, within, uh, the bosom of the church. You say in the book um, that being, um, quote, self-sufficient for long periods of time is not good. Do you think that now is the time for them to come in and be regularized when things are so hostile in light of Traditionis Custodes and Cor Arans and even today's breaking news with the change to canon law on new, um, uh, on, on new religious communities? Or do you think that they should continue to wait? It is really difficult now in this time, as you mentioned, with traditionis custodes. It is 
a document which is substantially rejecting the traditional form of holy liturgy which was celebrated uh, centuries, millennium. This is very serious. A pope cannot in such a form express his rejection of this treasure of the church. This is, and then issue norms uh, which limit uh, drastically, really, this form, this treasure of the church, which uh, his predecessors, John Paul II and Benedict XVI, guaranteed to the faithful. So this is a very serious aspect in this pontificate. And, and then the, the persecution, in de facto, of the cloistered nuns yes. uh, with the core orange document to forcing them uh, to change their strict cloistered contemplative life and uh, coming out and traveling for meetings, for federation sessions and so on. This is a great harm really for the entire church because it is affecting uh, what the church has one of the most precious pearls this is the strictly contemplative life is saint teresa of avila the great saint teresa restored with the strict i repeat cloistered life not going out and, and me for meetings or to, and so on this was um, exactly for this reason, St. Teresa of Avila uh, introduced again the old contemplative rules. Uh, and so now the Vatican is abolishing de facto these rules. Uh, I say de facto not by uh, theoretically, but come forcing the sisters to travel and to have frequent sessions outside the cloister and so on. So, and in this, in this situation, I think it is, it would be difficult for the Society of Pius X, then they had to also to observe these rules for their yeah. contemplative nuns, let us say, and uh, they will be, of course, the Pope could say today, you, you will not be a, uh, touched by the tra traditionis custodis norms, the, the, church, the Holy See could give them an exemption and say, okay, okay, we will give you the recognition, the full recognition and the, the guarantee that uh, the traditionis custodis is not applying to you or the core orange for your contemplative sisters. If they would receive such guarantees, I think they could accept a canonical regularization because this will give them more possibilities to work for the church and this is the aim of the society of Pius not for themselves to have privileges but to uh, to transmit the catholic faith in the integrity and purity and the catholic life and uh, the liturgy and therefore i think if I repeat, um, the Holy See would give them these guarantees. They could accept, should accept a regularization. Yeah. Because this is the normal situation of a Catholic to be regularized by the Holy See, by the Church. Barring that exception, though, uh, in the absence of Pope Francis saying, hey, I exempt you from court arounds and from this latest change that he made today and from, uh, and from traditionalist custodis, it seems as though the society will have to wait. My follow-up question is then, the, the bishops of the Society of St. Pius X are not getting any younger. And if they have to continue to wait, it seems to me that more uh, bishops will become necessary. Should Do you think it would be prudent for them to, uh, by the way, the, the organization has grown uh, such that, you know, the couple bishops that they already have can hardly administer all the sacraments that are unique to bishops like confirmation, holy orders. Um, would it be prudent for them to consecrate 
a new crop of bishops as they continue to wait for uh, regularization. And I would say, as I repeat, they should apply for a regularization, asking explicitly to be exempt from traditionis custodes and core orans, these norms, and have the guarantees, and 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 at the same time asking uh, the papal mandate to consecrate uh, at least uh, a couple of bishops, uh, uh, new bishops, with the papal approval for their apostolate, because it is necessary to continue their work for the sake for the church, not for their own. So I, I understand this. So, so I would not wait, but I would apply concretely together. So this exemption of these norms and in the same time, the, um, the approval of the ordination, the consecration of new bishops, or at least uh, even it could be done before the regularization, the, the full canonical regularization. It could be done that they ask simply the Pope, please authorize these candidates that we can ordain them with your permission uh, as bishops to, to carry uh, out this uh, task for the benefit of the faithful and the priests in which uh, we are taking to uh, to whom we, we serve. I mean, they have to ask the Pope explicitly for this permission, I think. Yeah. Um, I know you only have 10 minutes left. And so, and I have so many more questions and I'm so grateful for your time, Your Excellency. I want to go to some uh, a recent comment by Pope Francis just from the other day, and then and then contrast that with something you wrote about Vatican II. So just uh, yesterday, Pope Francis says that the problem with Vatican II is precisely this. In some contexts, the council has not yet been accepted. It is also true that it takes a century for a council to take root. We still have 40 years to make it take root then. This is what he said yesterday. I want to contrast that with what you wrote on page 277. You say, it's possible that the texts of the Second Vatican Council may also contain erroneous statements and that they will have to be corrected in the future by the magisterium. We should not be scandalized at the thought of a possible future correction of present errors. There can be no doubt that there are errors in the documents of Vatican II. And yet Pope Francis is saying that they have 40 more years to convince us that those errors don't exist. Uh, if you're a faithful, what is your advice to faithful Catholics who have to live you know, in the world, in the church for the next 40 years, uh, possibly, you know, with, uh, with a Francis II, uh, you know, uh, on the, on the future horizon, uh, how do we outlive and outlast the errors of Vatican II until they are, God willing, someday corrected? Well, we cannot say that that will be our friends for Francis II. Uh, we have to believe that the church is in the hands of God. Even if Pope Francis would plan now to, that his successor would be exactly the same, uh, continuing the same agenda, I think that God will not permit this. God will intervene because it is the Church of God, not of Pope Francis or of Pope Paul VI. It is the Church of God of all times, of St. Peter, and so on. This is my first remark. The second, that, well, Pope Francis did not state exactly what you said in your, uh, what you said now. He did not say the errors. He simply spoke of Vatican Council in general. So I don't know what he meant concretely by this. Simply saying Vatican II, there, there can be so many issues and topics oh. within this expression Vatican II. So I can also uh, apply to this expression of Pope Francis the some statements, let us say, in the 
uh, liturgical document of the council, liturgical constitution, Sacrosanctum Concilium, where is stated that the Latin language must be kept in all celebrations of the Roman rite. So let us say. And now this is not observed. And in this case, Pope Francis is right to applying to this, let us say, document. <laughs> this expression, he is he is true. He is not yet observed. Maybe in 40 years the church will return that the Latin language should will be again kept and used as Vatican II demanded. So it was a must, not a can. And uh, the other uh, that the bishops must provide that all the faithful are capable to sing and to 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 pray the ordinary texts of the mass in Latin, Kyrie Gloria, Credo Sanctus Agnus Dei. This is not observed. This demand of Vatican II. So in this case, Pope Francis is right. So if, if we apply this or other statements in the council that no priest has the right to introduce something in the mass to omit something or to add something in the holy Ma in the in the liturgy so this is a very uh, powerful statement of the council no priest has the right mm -hmm. to omit or to add something during the liturgy so this is also a good prescription of the council so and so on so therefore we have to distinguish and examine what pope francis meant here concretely by this expression vatican ii as i repeat yeah. the expression of vatican ii became so vague and so a pretext for for there to promote their own agenda and this yes. is also not just so we have to carefully to distinguish this but in the on the other hand i think we have not to to take that at serious simply councils because the councils this only a mode a manner of the magisterium not the only one the unique of the magisterium to explain the divine revelation to explain or to apply concretely what god revealed us and the magisterium again vatican II said a very good expression in uh, dei verbum 10 that the magisterium in this case also a council or a pope is not above the word of god and he is not above the tradition, but beneath. So he is has to be subordinated. And this is a good expression of the Vatican II. So uh, what uh, the, the, I repeat, the councils, there, there were 21 councils and there were several councils whom we do not more remember. Even the name, even the name we don't know. When you say what what established the the fourth council of constantinople in the ninth century it's rarely that someone will know this sure. or what established uh, the first lateran council the the first lateran council we know was was more famous but the first i don't know or the the fifth lateran council in 1511 it's very rare that people know of this, even priests and bishops, they simply for, forget this. And because it's not the issue, the, the substance of our faith, I repeat, the mode of the magisterium. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, the magisterium can exercise in different manners, even without councils. Councils are not this only are the extraordinary form of the exercise of the magisterium. It can be even there the church lived centuries without an ecumenical council. 
and the, the church life was very um, uh, prosperous and and fruitful uh, between the the Council of Trent and the First Vatican Council. Three hundred years there were no council, and the, the, this was the time of the most. Uh, 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 fruitful time of the mission, missionary activity of the church, uh, especially, right. and the increasing of saints and priestly vocations. So, uh, I think we have to be more uh, balanced regarding the councils it's, it, it itself. We have to look at the content, not the council itself, but the content, what a council transmitted and and this content what is ever valid for all times not only for a short historical period and so what the majority of what the text of the Vatican Council stated it was a re repeated simply the previous councils the majority of the text and uh, some uh, own state statements of the Vatican Council. Some of them were truly uh, useful, which I quoted now. This, and others were problematic, and they will be corrected in the future, or simply f will be forgotten, or or corrected. But we have to, I think, to more to be concentrated to the faith itself, to the beauty of our Catholic faith to the richness of our holy liturgy, mm. to the treasure of the lives of the saints, uh, to promote the family life, the new priestly vocations, and this will renew the church. And this is the issue. The issue is not a council, but the Catholic faith. How to promote, again, the fullness of the purity, of the integrity of the Catholic faith. And this will renew the life of the church with a new generation of holy priests, zealous missionaries, and good new Catholic families. Amen. Wonderful answer. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. I don't know if you have time for one more question, but I have a burning one, and it's about and it's yes. about philosophy. Uh, okay, here it is. You write. Uh, you, you're referring to the Hegelian dialectic here. You say, today many theologians and bishops are plagued by Hegelianism. Some succumb to it consciously, others unconsciously. Hegel said that after the thesis comes the antithesis, and from their combination is born the synthesis. This is exactly the reasoning of many Catholic Hegelians today. Catholicism before the council was a thesis. The conciliar and post-conciliar church was an antithesis. And now we are moving towards a synthesis. I'm wondering if you can explain to folks, this is on page 46 of your book, Springtime That Never Came. What, what exactly you mean by that? Are we, um, is, is your view that, that we're gonna, we can keep most of uh, Vatican II and just line item out the things that are, that are wrong with it? Is that, is that more or less what you're saying here? Yes. Because Vatican II was a ecumenical council, it was a council of the church, it's our mother church, we have, we have to accept this, but I say, but not to overstate this, it, it's only one of the 21 councils, I repeat, the council is not, uh, uh, how do you say, so substantially necessary, but what is necessary is the content of our faith. And the, and the church authority, the magisterium has other means of promote and transmit the content of our faith and protect it. So, uh, of course, we have to keep what the council said good, and there are the majority of the affirmations are traditional uh, Catholic faith. So we can accept this. I quoted some. Of, and I can I can find other good quotations which are helpful, and sure. so we, why not? We have to be uh, just also and accept these other uh, affirmations which are ambiguous or erroneous, since they are not had been proclaimed with the intention of 
infallible teaching, that the Council did not have this intention, even propositely avoided this. So there is no problem to that these expressions could be later uh, corrected or, or they could be added uh, uh, supplement explanation supplementary explanation. I, I don't see any problem in this, that even an expression of a council could be later a not uh, infallible, a fallible expression. And there are in the past councils, you can make a inquiry, a research, there are uh, some pastoral expressions in the council, let us say, of uh, the Fourth Lateran Council, which was an ecumenical council, made statements which are, to our opinion, erroneous uh, regarding the Jewish people, that we have to keep them all in a ghetto, that we have to, the, the Jewish people, when they come out uh, on the streets, had to be marked with a sign that they are Jewish. And uh, when a Christian take uh, in, in the household uh, a servant, a Jewish have to, or a Muslim as a servant in the household, this Catholic has to be excommunicated. So you see, these expressions had to be corrected, and they were corrected now later. These expressions of the Ecumenical Council, of the First Ecumenical Council, or other expressions. And so, therefore, I don't see any problem that some expressions of the, Se the Second Vatican Council could be uh, corrected. Respectfully, of course, say that these expressions were made in a pastoral intention, mm -hmm. according to the historical circumstances of those years. And uh, it was after careful exa exam, uh, revealed themselves as not sufficiently clear or ambiguous. Or, no, and so they can be later, uh, maybe in a respectful manner, or de facto be corrected. Well, I, I have to thank you so much for your time. I know that you, um, it's, it's Corpus Christi for you already. It's the morning of Corpus Christi and you must go. Um, but the book is called uh, The Springtime That Never Came. It's best to buy the book directly from the publisher, uh, Sophia Institute Press. There's a link in the show notes to this show. Your Excellency, I'm going to play a uh, you know a one minute kind of outro. You don't have to stand, stick around and watch it. You can you can log off, but uh, I really uh, appreciate you coming on RTF. And I hope that one of these Friday nights for the United States, Saturday morning for you, we do. Sort of a sort of a, a fun news roundup with four of us. I would be honored if you would uh, love to join that. It's called the Rundown. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, and God bless you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs>